Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today we are taking a look at the current version of Space Engine. We are in a beta phase right now. Uh, the developer has upgraded it to, was it, 0.974, and that includes a number of updates. One of which is some new ring textures on Saturn, which are really rather pretty. We have these nice aurora down here as well. Yeah, you know, Space Engine, not really a game so much as it is a thing to explore with, right? There's no uh, gameplay per se, there's no challenges, except in finding something really interesting in this vast universe. This, of course, this well of inky blackness, is the Shadow of Titan, which apparently the eclipse at this distance isn't 100% reliable. Let's see if I move in towards it though, whether we can actually make the eclipse a little more permanent. Ah, there we go. Yes, small distances can make things very confusing. Oh, and we've lost Titan again. Where is it? it must be there. We're gonna run into it any minute now, no doubt. Oh, there it is, see? Oh. <laughs> this is what happens with this game. Because space is big, you have to go very, very fast and you have to go very, very slow. Um, yeah, Titan, of course, isn't that interesting to look at because it's largely a big orange ball with a, an atmosphere. There are Titan worlds on other, in other, you know, generated worlds, procedurally generated Titans, which will have flora and fauna and things like that, but not this one. This one has a pretty vague surface. Now, I actually have, in this particular one, all of the texture pack updates that have come from the community. So uh, this is the version with you know, gigs and gigs and gigs and gigs of surface maps, cloud maps, bump maps, texture maps. So uh, this is looking better than the, the normal version, the default version. Now they've added some other uh, updated textures because of course this has been a, an interesting year for small solar system explosion, uh, ex explosion, exploration. For example, Pluto and Charon now have textures that have been provided by the New Horizons flypast. We're just gonna zip over there. Look at my distance in the top left there. We're gonna arrive at it and then we're gonna break just at the last minute using the magic of space engines, engines. There we go, doesn't that look familiar? Yes, yeah, you've probably all seen that by now, including the big uh, heart or butt, depending upon who you're talking to, or butterfly. That's, that's possibly what people will call it. So, I mean, there's, it's mostly, a texture in this case. We don't have a proper bump map at this time. And I keep saying we, what I mean is that we have not been provided a proper bump map by uh, the developers or by the astrophysicists in charge of the New Horizons mission. Data is still being analyzed and collected. Obviously, they, uh, they can construct some 3D data from looking at images as they pass, you know, they basically take images in close succession and they can produ produce stereoscopic information. Well, let's uh, zoom out, we'll just fly out and we'll see what other objects there are. We have uh, Nix, which we can go to, just pressing G will let me fly in very quickly using the automatic pilot here. So Space Engine, I hear, may be appearing on Steam at some point. And that would be a really nice way for the project to be funded because, you know, I uh, I really like Space Engine. I like what it does. It's not really a game, but it is a fantastic place to lose yourself exploring things. Well, let's move further away. So, um, other updates. Of course, everyone remembers New Horizons, but there was uh, also a visit to uh, Ceres, if you remember click there and go to that. So we should have a new map of series, and this will have relief data as I understand it. Let's move in and take a look. Yeah, that looks like actual proper, proper structured, you know, surface and everything there. Let's try and get into this crater here that looks slightly different due to its coloring. Now, I'm, I'm gonna point out that while uh, these images may have these color changes in the, the, well, the images returned from the spacecraft, it's not necessarily what you would see if you were there in orbit. A lot of spacecraft imagery is adjusted to bring out features and things like that. So what you would see versus what the astronomers like to show you is always, there's always some differences in that there. 
you know, mostly a lot of these things would just seem dull and grey and boring. But, uh, you know, of course, they're fascinating if you're actually into this kind of thing. Let's say I just accelerate time and watch it rotate here. We should look for those, for the little crater with the hot spot, the white spot. That is, of course, a place where mineral salts are being deposited. That's what it's presumed. Okay, ah, uh, there we go. Right there. So we can pause that and then fly down into it and get a nicer look at this crater in full 3D. Look. Whoa. You could fly over this. You can see the central cap here or the central peak. That's what happens in large craters. You'll get a central kind of peak as the crater bounces back after the impact. And uh, yeah, also looking like that's where the deposition is. Will we ever know all the secrets? No, of course, there'll always be new things to find out. But uh, Dawn may not be finishing its mission around Ceres. It was originally planned it would end up there, but it turns out that it may have enough fuel to get to a new destination, and they've applied for a new mission to a new place. And speaking of new places... Churimyov Grasmienko, which is, of course, the comet that Rosetta visited. And uh, looks like a full-on rubber ducky, right? Well, we can try to look at it, you know, move around. Of course, we can just uh, play time forward and watch it rotate. Uh, I'm thinking that this flickering in the background may in fact be because there's a comet tail. That's what that is, you see? And it's probably interacting poorly with the, uh, with the galactic, you know, the galactic background there. So if I come from this angle, oh, we might get better. <laughs> <laughs> High speeds, short distances, requires a lot of work here. There we go. Look at that. So, yeah, the background does not really lend itself well to that. But you can get an idea of the shape of things. I don't think that... I'm not sure how close that is to the actual model that has been published, or if the model has indeed been published. Everybody says it looks like a giant rubber ducky. Which apparently turns out to be a regular feature in comets, and there's a pretty good paper recently that suggests that comets, uh, because they're so dynamic, they tend to break up and then they reform because of the stresses due to their uh, active nature. Let's go to Vesta, that's the next one. Bring ourselves to another object which has been updated. Oh look, there's the Pleiades right there. So Vesta was also visited by the Dawn space probe, and so it has it has much better uh, surface maps and everything now. This is a lot less spherical. Uh, okay, they're a lot less spherical than Ceres. We, again, we do have a full 3D map in this, so you can fly down into one of the craters if you like. Get an idea of what it would be like to float on the surface of this, uh, stand on the surface of this if you had a very low quality camera. Nice, so there you go. So we can just kind of climb up. Oh, okay, I was gonna say we could climb up the side, but there we go. And that is Orion in the background, choosing to sneeze at an unfortunate time. Oh my God, you have to see the amount of slime he has just produced from his nose. It is not, it is almost as impressive as this landscape. Uh, unfortunately, I did not get to experience the mucus event in <laughs> in the glory of CGI. I got to experience it in reality. Okay, so other features. So they've got an enhanced planet catalog. They've enhanced a lot of atmosphere models. And another thing they've done is Sagittarius A and many other black holes now have much better rendering accretion disks and things like this. So we're now in the center of the galaxy and we do have an accretion disk which we can look at. Oh yes, of course, in the core of the galaxy, we have many, many, many stars close by. Look at that, let's travel in closer. You can see the stars being gravitationally lensed. I'm gonna slow down as I fly over this. Nice, nice, nice. Of course, it looks like there's a bump in the disk. There's not actually a bump in the disk. That is gravitational lensing that's happening there, right? If you if you look away, if you were able to look around that without the gravitational lensing, you would not see a bump. And actually, if you fly just over the black hole, oh, and there's a star there. 
Well, I mean, obviously there's stars there because that's how we know that Sagittarius A exists. We can see stars actually orbiting it, you know, in 3D, or whatever. We can see the we can see their ellipses, and some of them get very, very close to this supermassive black hole. I'm not actually sure if this is a real star or this is a procedurally generated star. This is a, obviously a very busy part of the universe with all that gravity and attraction going on. Oh, well, whatever. Let's go back here. Yeah, if we fly down into this... So, if I park myself... Hold on. If I do this and park myself over the top of this and then bring myself up. If I look around, it's gonna be like I'm inside a bowl because gravity is lensing the light downward. But if I go up uh, higher and higher and higher, it disappears, it becomes flatter. So as I come down, what happens is everything gets lensed upwards. This is me moving in at several, you know, tens of times the speed of light here. Of course, uh, faster than you could actually fall into the real black hole. So. Now, so close to the middle of this thing, uh, it's actually like I'm sitting inside a bowl, looking up at the accretion disk as it is being lensed over the top of me here. It's of course just standard relativistic light bending here. It's pretty cool. What else do we have in the universe? They've got just so many items, so many things that we can look at. Uh, they also have, of course, a bunch of procedurally generated things. Tatooine, Pandora, Double Eclipse Shadow, Galactic Monster. Oh, Galactic Monster's already there. A black hole near a star cluster. Moons, moons everywhere. Let's go to it and see. Ooh, very nice. We get moons there, we get moons there. And we have a surface here that we can get down onto and appreciate. Again, gotta be careful here with my speed. It's an airless, cold world. Uh, one of the minor changes I noticed, incidentally, is that the terrain generation settings are kind of locked. The highest level of terrain generation is now locked behind the console, because what would happen if you set your terrain generation detail to level 2, which is the maximum, then you would fly down to a world and then you would watch the landscape contours get painted out ahead of you. And it would take a really long time to do it at the highest resolution, so people would just set it up for screenshots or things like this. And you'll see this as I fly over the surface, that the terrain will kind of pop in and appear as I do this. Um, so yeah, the yeah terrain level 1 is now what you have access to. Terrain level 2 is basically for people that want to spend forever. I actually do occasionally spend forever. When you see some of those 360 videos I've made, I made those by flying around at about, you know, three frames per second recording. I did it deliberately slow. I undercranked my camera, so to speak, because I wanted to give the CPU plenty of time to build out those other terrain models. Here's a nice little uh, asteroidal moon, small enough that it doesn't have any, it hasn't been pulled into a sphere by its own self-gravity. And uh, you can see it's illuminated on one side by the planet shine from the planet below. Or it might not be a planet, that might be... I'm not sure if that's a planet or another moon, to be honest. But it looks rather pretty with those lines flying across it. Yeah, a lot of nice looking stuff. Space engine, oh my god, it is so darn pretty. Elsewhere in the universe, we find this uh, desert world with uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide atmosphere. One of the things that has been added to the new release, or was one of the things that's been developed a bit more, is atmosphere chemistry. Chemistry of the atmosphere is, of course, very important. An atmosphere without any life will tend to fall into some sort of equilibrium with the various chemical constituents. Uh, this planet here, or this moon maybe, is a cool Oceana. It's called... Oh, it's, it's uh, actually a procedural planet around a real star. Uh, but this one has been given an atmosphere composition of carbon dioxide, uh, methane, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and uh, ethene. That's interesting. It's ethene rather than ethane. I think that's correct, right? C2H4 is ethene, and yeah. I, I actually forget. Ooh. Or is it ethylene? No. Poly, no, it's po ethene, because polyethene is made up of these, right? So these are nice because you can uh, polymerize them, and when you just keep on polymerizing them, you get polythene. Hence the name, polyethene, which of course is uh, simplified for us plebs. Oh, look, we have an aurora over this moon as well. 
That's cool. Must be some serious magnetic fields going on here. Elsewhere in the universe, let's see what else we can see. Uh, Kepler 452b. Now, this is this is obviously an imagining of what Kepler 452 could be. So, Kepler 452 found by the Kepler space probe, and it's found because it passed in front of the star, and. Uh, well, a tiny amount of it passed in front of the star. This is way smaller than the star. So you have to imagine as you go further away, less and less of the star gets covered by this until eventually uh, it doesn't eclipse it at all, or it barely eclipses it. There, that's a perfect example. So if we just zoom further back, you can imagine that tiny shadow passing in front of that star, except we would be way, 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 way further away. And it was less than 1% of the light that was blocked. Now, based on that tiny amount of light that's blocked, scientists in the Kepler mission were able to determine that there was a planet that was about 1.6 times the size of the Earth. They were able, based upon the periodicity, right, the, because they saw multiple encounters, they were able to figure out um, how fast it was moving and therefore what kind of orbit it was in. And so therefore, they figured out with the star being the, the brightness of the star, which in this case is a yellow dwarf, which is roughly the same size as the sun. And the fact that this planet is uh, about one AU from the star, hey, or guess what? This thing is very similar to Earth, at least in terms of distance and parent star, although its mass is 3.6 times higher. The surface gravity on this thing is uh, about 40% higher than Earth. But anyway, yeah, I mean, they said, this could be habitable. And they say could be habitable. Probably not, but we don't know. I mean, in this case, they've given the procedural generation code has given an atmosphere of carbon dioxide, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and again, uh, oh, C2H2. So that's interesting that that's there rather than anything else. I'm not, I'm not sure how that equilibrium mechanics work on that, to be honest. I'm not a chemist, and I don't really know how uh, this stuff is calculated, although I could imagine that you're just modeling energy pathways and reactions and trying to figure out where the average energy, or the, the lowest, most stable uh, distribution of gases turns out. Yeah, if you've ever seen sci-fi movies, of course you've seen sci-fi movies. If you've seen sci-fi movies or TV shows where people step out onto a barren world and take off their helmet and there's an oxygen atmosphere, that almost certainly doesn't happen in the universe without life doing something because oxygen is uh, very useful for us living things because it is highly reactive and it reacts nicely with the sugars and stuff that we use to gain energy. However, because it's very reactive, means it will almost certainly oxidize anything that isn't already oxidized and disappear from the atmosphere. Unless there is, say, plants, which are adjusting the equilibrium and converting carbon dioxide into oxygen as part of the whole circle of life. And so yes, uh, Space Engine 0 0.974, still in development, I uh, haven't forgotten about it, and, and one of the nice things I've really been impressed with, Beery, been happy messing with, is the cylindrical projection, which now lets you do 360 videos from this whole thing. You'll be seeing a lot more of these from me. Until then, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.